the committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee's mission statement is that we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn obligation is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. It is our job to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. A few days ago, the acting IRS Commissioner, Danny Wilfel, issued a 30-day assessment on his plan of action for the future of the IRS. The report stated that in many instances across the IRS, we had efficient, effective management or effective management that is leading positive organizational performance. Unfortunately, we are here today because failures within the IRS are not isolated to just tax-exempt division. The revelation that, that a company called Strongcastle was able to acquire more than $500 million in potential contracts or in contracts for potential sales with no previous track record completely undermines the IRS narrative that just one branch or department within the IRS failed the American people. Our report, we believe, shows a cozy relationship between Strong Castle's president and the IRS Deputy Director for Information Technology Acquisitions, Greg, Greg Roseman. And it is the heart of this issue. Included in, the, uh, <clears throat> included in our report are exchanges of text messages that we believe are shockingly inappropriate and in some cases offensive. Furthermore, the fact that Mr. Castillo was able to successfully manipulate the system, and we are not alleging a crime, but successfully manipulate the, quest the uh, system to acquire contracts exposes staggering vulnerability in the IRS's acquisition process and jeopardize, jeopardizes billions of taxpayer dollars at, uh, <clears throat> uh, in this situation. Quite frankly, we are not sure that we have criminal element here, that we have criminal violations. What we are sure of is that the intent of Congress and the stated intent of this and each administration before has been thwarted. The intention of, without a doubt, that disabled military veterans receive preference flies in the face of a small injury in 1984 while attending the Military Academy prep school, one so minor that it had no effect on college football participation for years to follow and that took 27 years to conveniently ask to have this put in as a disability, not because of the true disability or inability to perform a job, but in fact in order to qualify for a preference statement. Additionally, the use of hub zones, and in this case one that was a legacy hub zone that actually the Verizon Center and the other parts of, of Washington, D.C are moving out of that into thriving areas, the use of that in order to gain a, uh, a contract and then creating absolutely no jobs within that district that were directly related to uh, or in support of this $500 million contract. Our investigation is still in its infancy. Today <clears throat> we are working with the IG and hope to work with others within the IRS to end this problem. As we speak, many of these contracts continue to be in force. And perhaps that is the most distressing, is that the IRS officials immediately, uh, <coughs> excuse me, initially denied and then repeated their denial that there was a problem. They failed to take action after this was brought to their attention, and the IRS is still allowing a $266 million contract with Strong Castle to stand. 
<clears throat> the action by the Inspector General when he was notified of these allegations almost a year ago was a lack of urgency that the American taxpayers deserve. In our evaluation, we find no value added performed by Strongcastle. I repeat, no value added performed by Strongcastle, although profits flow to that company over and above the full payment to the companies who actually provide the IRS with those services. No hearing related to the IRS would be complete without mentioning that under Obamacare, the task of the IRS to implement at least 47 new provisions, including 18 new taxes, uh, expected to raise $1 trillion over the next decade, and the hiring of thousands of new employees, the need for computer systems to work and work accurately, begs the question of can we afford to implement Obamacare if we cannot get the systems and controls in place for existing uh, requirements. Just this year, the IRS has requested nearly $500 million, the same amount of money the IRS plans to award to Strongcastle to enforce Obamacare, including 2,000 new full-time employees. We are not trying to say that one is interchangeable with the other, but it is very clear this is a lot of money, and it is a lot of money that could, for a fraction, 2 or 3 or 4 percent savings, be passed on to the American people. <clears throat> Often on this dais, we applaud appropriately Federal workers. And I want to take a moment to make it clear, the vast majority of people involved in contracting in the Federal workforce take contracting seriously. They scrutinize the contracts and, most often, try to get the best value for the taxpayer. Because the best value is not always the lowest price, this is a difficult job, and it requires absolute integrity. If we do not have full confidence in our procurement integrity, then we must choose the lowest price. The lowest price is not always the best value for the taxpayer. But the analytics of lowest price versus lowest value depends on an independent, non-cozy relationship between the contracting officers and their superiors and the contractor. This committee has over the years applauded and will continue to applaud that most contracts have that characteristic. They are not always awarded the way contractors would like, but they are based on best value to the taxpayer. In this case, at least for this chair and our uh, draft report, we don't believe that occurred, and that is the reason that we are continuing our investigation. I now like to recognize and thank the Ranking Member for being my full partner in this investigation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you for calling this hearing. It is indeed a very important hearing. Um, and it is interesting, this hearing is to examine allegations against a company named Strong Castle, Inc. that has been awarded $51 million in obligations under information technology contracts with the Internal Revenue Service. The first uh, allegation made against Strong Castle last December was that the company's owner, a local businessman from Northern Virginia named Braulio Castillo, took improper advantage of the historically underutilized business zone program, the Hub Zone, while setting up uh, his companies here in Washington, D.C. Let me say from the outset that I have a tremendous interest in hub zones. I have lived in what would considered be a hub zone for 32 years in the same house, where I would imagine that black unemployment, male unemployment is probably 35 percent unemployment, where businesses struggle trying to become a part of this economy and trying to do well. And now I have lived long enough and seen enough 
to be able to tell you that I have worked with a lot of those small business people who have felt quite often that they weren't on the playing field. As a matter of fact, they felt that they weren't even in the stadium. And they have lived long enough and struggled long enough, and now I have seen many of them die, chasing a dream, trying to get there, looking for a playing field that is simply level, but they can't even get on the field. And so the purpose of the Hub Zone program is to help small businesses increase employment, investment and economic development in historically underutilized business areas. As part of this program, which is overseen by the Small Business Administration, companies may receive preferred status when bidding on Federal contract. In order to qualify, Mr. Castillo opened one small office in a hub zone near Chinatown, the Chinatown neighborhood of Washington, D.C. He then worked with the head football coach at Catholic University, his former college roommate, to hire college students living in a different hub zone near that school. Mr. Costello's former employer and current competitor, Government Acquisitions, Inc., filed protests with SBA and the Government Accountability Office. The company accused Mr. Costello of engaging in, quote, shell game, quote, end of quote, with multiple businesses and employees. The facts to gain the preferred status, end of quote. SBA investigated these allegations and decertified Mr. Castillo's company as a hub zone contractor on May 23, 2013. I ask unanimous consent that the SBA's decertification letter be placed into the hearing record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. SBA determined that Mr. Costello's company submitted employee records that were, quote, false and inaccurate, end of quote. It also concluded that the company, quote, does not have the adequate internal controls to independently verify employee records, end of quote. Despite these findings, I credit Mr. Scosillo for appearing before the committee today. He participated in a nine-hour interview with committee staff. He provided documents to us and to SBA, and he is here to explain his actions. Our committee staff also conducted extensive interviews with almost all of his employees. Another major allegation involves Mr. Costello's personal relationship with an IRS employee named Greg Roseman. Mr. Mr. Roseman did not disclose his relationship to the contracting officers who awarded contracts to Strong Castle, to his direct supervisor at the IRS, or to the IRS Office of General Legal Services. This certainly concerns everybody on this dais. Mr. Roseman was not the contracting officer ultimately responsible for awarding the contracts to Mr. Costillo's company, but he participated in the contracting process as a voting member of the Contract Review Board for two of these contracts. No IRS officials reported having any knowledge of Mr. Costillo's relationship with Mr. Roseman. In addition, no contracting officials or other IRS employee interviewed by the committee reported any inappropriate influence by Mr. Roseman on the contracting process. Nevertheless, the evidence obtained by the committee indicates at least an appearance of impropriety because Mr. Roseman did not disclose this relationship or recuse himself from the contracting process. Regarding their personal relationship, Mr. Costello stated during his interview with committee staff, and I quote, Greg, Roseman, and I are friends, end of quote. In addition, on May 15, 2013, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration reported that Mr. Costello and Mr. Roseman had exchanged text messages on their personal cell phones that, quote, contained inappropriate language and lacked professional decorum, end of quote. Three hundred of these text messages included both work-related and personal communications. 
They also included, obviously, inappropriate communications with juvenile and offensive homosexual slurs and mocking references to another IRS employee. Mr. Roseman has been reassigned pending the completion of the Inspector General's review and is no longer overseeing procurement matters. Earlier this week, his attorney wrote to the committee indicating that Mr. Roseman is invoking his Fifth Amendment right not to testify today. I am not here to defend his actions, but this is his right under the Constitution and as members of Congress, we are bound to respect that right. And just one other note, the Chairman talked about the tremendous responsibility that the IRS will now, uh, well, has been facing with regard to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I have said it from this desk before, but I will say it again. We, all of us, everybody up here has fired people, all of us. And bad actors does not stop the show. This is the United States of America. If we have problems in an institution and if people are not doing their jobs, they have to go. But that doesn't mean that the law, the law, the Affordable Care Act, should not and cannot be administered by that agency. We are a can-do nation. We are a can-do nation. And it is part of our obligation, all of us, to make sure, as the Chairman has said, that we put right this ship and make sure that it sails so that it can accomplish the things that the Congress had voted for and that we have stood up for, and that is the law. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from my witnesses, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. And we now recognize our panel. Mr. Bla Brad Floor is Senior Advisor for Compensation Service for the Veterans Benefits Administration at the U.S. Veterans Administration. <clears throat> Mr. Michael Chodas is the Associate Administrator of the Office of Entrepreneurial Development at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Ms. Beth Tucker is the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support at the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Gregory Roseman is the Deputy Director for Enterprise Networks and Tier System Support at the Internal Revenue Service, and I believe that is a previous title, but we will use it for now. Mr. William A. Sisk is Deputy Commissioner for Federal Acquisition Services at the General Services Administration, or GSA. Welcome. And Mr. Braulio Castillo is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Strong Castle. Pursuant to the Committee regulations, would you please all rise, raise your right hands to take the oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect, please be seated, let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Before I continue, and because uh, this committee is acutely aware that one or more on the panel may choose to assert their Fifth Amendment rights, and because this Chair does not want to have anyone waive that right accidentally, involuntarily, or in any other way, does anyone here at this time intend to invoke their Fifth Amendment rights? Mr. Roseman? Yes, sir. I do intend to waive my fifth, I, I intend to invoke my Fifth Amendment right to be okay. silent. Mr. Roseman, you not, have not provided any written testimony today, is that correct? Okay. Uh, I understand from your counsel that you may want to assert your constitutional privileges, and you have already said that is correct. Mr. Roseman, today's hearing will cover topics including waste, fraud, and abuse of government contracting set-asides. As Deputy Director, Enterprise Networks and Tier Systems support <coughs> at the Internal Revenue Service, you are uniquely qualified 
to provide testimony that will help the committee better understand information technology acquisition practices at the irs to that end i once again must ask you to consider answering questions that will bear uh, on that subject with us mr roseman what is your title at the irs Mr. Chairman, my title is what is, was uh, Deputy Director of Enterprise Network and Tier Systems Procurement. Mr. T Mr. Roseman, to whom do you report at the IRS? Would you do that once again? I apologize. Mr. Chairman, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer any questions and invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege to remain silent. Mr. Roseman, when did you first become aware of a company known as Strongcastle, Inc.? Mr. Chairman, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer any questions and invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege to remain silent. Mr. Roseman, are you currently employed by the IRS? Mr. Chairman, on the advice of counsel, I respectfully decline to answer any questions and invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege to remain yes. silent. Lastly, Mr. Roseman. Are you prepared to answer any questions here today about your role in the IRS acquisitions and information technology products and services from Strongcastle, Inc.? Mr. Chairman, no. <clears throat> Mr. Cummings, do you have any, any questions before I dismiss the witness? Uh, no, I, I have no questions. Uh, and I, uh, as we uh, respect the witnesses' uh, right to uh, remain silent, consistent with the Fifth Amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I have no objections with the Chairman dismissing this witness. Given that the witness has indicated that he does not intend to answer any questions and out of respect for his right under the Constitution, I will now ask the committee to excuse the witness, take away his name, and uh, we will take a short recess so that we can uh, reset the table. Mr. Roseman, you are excused. The committee will come to order. I would like to thank all the witnesses for their forbearance. 
the Chair would like to make sure we allow sufficient time, and even though we are slightly smaller now, there is still a large panel. So I would ask you to uh, recognize that your entire opening statements be placed in the record and to stay within the five minutes or very close to it. Uh, oops. And with that, you are recognized, Mr. Floor, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings and members of this committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you this morning to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs processes for granting service connection for disabled veterans and verifying service disabled veteran owned small businesses and veteran owned small businesses. VA is committed to making accurate decisions in claims for disability compensation as reflected in our goal of 98 percent accuracy by 2015 and monitoring the VOSB program. Oversight for these programs ensures that qualified veterans receive the benefits and business qualifications they have earned through their service to our nation. Disability compensation is a monthly benefit payable to veterans who have a disability or disabilities resulting from injury or disease incurred in or aggravated by active military service. Such service includes active duty, active duty for training, during which the individual concerned was disabled or died from disease or injury incurred or aggravated in line of duty, and inactive duty for training during which the individual concerned was disabled or died from injury incurred or aggravated in line of duty. Service consisting solely of attendance at any one of the preparatory schools of the service academies may constitute active duty or active duty for training for VA purposes, depending on the circumstances of the individual's service. VA's Office of General Counsel held in precedent opinions issued in 1994 and 1995 that characterization of an individual's service at a United States Academy preparatory school for purposes of entitlement to veterans' benefits depends upon the status in which the individual enters the school. Service by a person entering the school as a reservist called to duty for the sole purpose of attending the school or by one who is enlisted from civilian life or National Guard duty to attend the school constitutes active duty for training. In contrast, persons who enroll directly from active duty under a prior enlistment remain on active duty within the meaning of Title 38 during their attendance. Those individuals selected for enrollment in these preparatory schools are in the military. They wear the uniform, are paid based on their military rank, are subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and upon release from that period of uh, training, they are issued a DD-214 with either honorable service or other than honorable or whatever the characterization may be. In no November of 1995, VA amended its regulations to reflect our General Counsel's statutory interpretation concerning this uh, type of service. VA's statutory authority to compensate veterans for disability resulting from service stated in 38 United States Code Section 1110, is not limited to providing compensation for disabilities caused by military service. VA's statutory authority is to compensate veterans for disability incurred in or aggravated by service. Once an individual takes the oath to serve and protect the United States, they are on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If he or she is injured or develops a chronic disease, whether in combat or during routine activities, VA claims processors prepare a disability rating decision that determines entitlement to service connection and the amount of any disability benefits that may be payable. In determining whether a disability is related to military service, there must be evidence of an injury or disease or an exposure in service, medical or in certain circumstances lay evidence of a current disability, and evidence of a medical or scientific nexus or link between the current condition and the in-service event. VA has a statutory duty to assist claimants in gathering the required evidence. This includes obtaining certain supporting evidence and ordering a VA examination or requesting a medical opinion as necessary. VA reviews documents pertaining to military service and service treatment records obtained from the particular military service. VA also requests evidence identified by the claimant that may be pertinent to the claim and medical records from any private providers that we are made aware of. VA carefully evaluates all available evidence 
to determine if entitlement to service connection is established and, if so, the level of severity of the disability. VA's standard of proof in making these determinations is reasonable doubt. In addition to requesting and reviewing records from military service departments, newly hired claims processors are provided training on military records, which includes identifying any noted alterations or suspected fraudulent records. Each regional office also has a military record specialist with, with expertise in military records who serves as a liaison with other government agencies. VA employees are aware of their responsibility to ensure that benefits are awarded to those who are entitled to them. Upon a determination that fraud has occurred, a preliminary decision is made with respect to adjusting or terminating an award. The beneficiary is provided due process rights, including notice of the action to be taken, the reason for the adjustment, the right to representation, and the right to present evidence to rebut the evidence serving as the basis for the proposed adjustment. If no evidence is presented, the award is adjusted and the case is referred to the Office of the Inspector General for review and any further action that office may deem necessary. The Office of the Inspector General coordinates investigation with the United States Attorney's Office, State and local prosecutors. Mr. Flora, could you summarize, please? Uh, yes, sir. Um, that actually summarizes my statement on, on service connection. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Chodos. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify about the Small Business Administration's, or SBA's, role in the awarding of certain contracts to Signet Computers, Inc., and its successor, Strong Castle, Inc., a firm recently decertified by SBA as a historically underutilized business zone or hub zone entity. Before discussing the specifics of the SCI case, I would like to briefly describe the hub zone program and some of its recent successes. Its aim is to help small firms in underserved communities gain access to Federal contract opportunities. Generally, hub zones are urban or rural areas with very low median household incomes and or very high unemployment. The program requires certified companies to have their principal office in a hub zone and to employ individuals who reside in hub zones with the intention of spurring economic growth within the community. As of May 31, 2013, there were 5,029 certified hub zone small businesses. In FY12, over $8, billion, uh, over $8 billion were awarded to certified firms for work performed in all 50 states, including D.C., Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and the Northern Mariana Islands. In the case of SCI, the firm applied for hub zone certification on March 11, 2012 and was certified on June 22, 2012. SCI was awarded a blanket purchase agreement by the IRS on or about December 7, 2012. A hub zone status protest was filed with SBA by a competing firm on December 19, 2012. SBA could not process the protest based on applicable jurisdictional rules. However, SBA believed the information contained in the protest called into question SCI's hub zone eligibility. As a result, SBA promptly began its investigation into the eligibility of SCI for the hub zone program in late December of 2012. Based on the facts and evidence found during this investigation, SBA proposed SCI for decertification on January 31, 2013. It is important to note that this investigation and the resulting proposed decertification took place before and independent of the committee investigation of SCI. After a thorough review of the information provided to SBA in response to the proposed decertification, SBA decertified SCI on May 23, 2013. SBA takes very seriously its duty to root out fraud, waste, and abuse in all of the Federal small business contracting programs, including HUBZone. Our top priority at SBA is to ensure that the benefits of our programs flow to the intended recipients. Our government contracting programs are a critical and effective toolkit for small businesses. However, we have no tolerance for fraud, waste, and abuse in those programs. For this reason, we have implemented a comprehensive three-pronged strategy to identify, prevent, and pursue noncompliance or fraud across all our government contracting programs. First is effective certification processes. Clear and comprehensive eligibility screening on the front end ensures that only qualified, eligible firms participate in our programs. Second, continued surveillance and monitoring. Targeted and thorough examinations, reviews, and on-site visits 
identify potentially fraudulent firms or those that no longer qualify, and three, robust and timely enforcement. Prompt, proactive enforcement removes bad actors, deters wrongdoing, and provides integrity to our contracting programs. We are especially proud of our core partnership with the SBA's Office of Inspector General, whose assistance is critical to the success, to the success of our improvement efforts. Through ongoing and proactive collaboration with the Government Accountability Office and our stakeholders, SBA intends to protect the Federal Government commitment to aid and assist small business. The strategy and efforts described in my testimony reflect an integrated approach that utilizes resources across our Office of Government Contracting and Business Development, our General Counsel's Office, and our 68 district offices and others. As demonstrated by the initiatives and efforts described in this testimony, SBA has taken great strides to strengthen the small business contracting programs and implement a robust strategy to combat fraud, waste, and abuse. Work remains to be done to completely eliminate fraud, waste, and abuse in our programs as bad actors regretfully still attempt to take wrongful advantage of government benefits. While we have made significant progress, we continue to look for ways to identify further opportunities for improvement and to maximize small businesses' access to this important source of revenue so they can do what they do best, start, grow, and create jobs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Ms. Tucker. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Beth Tucker, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support at the Internal Revenue Service. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I have been an IRS employee for 29 years. I started my IRS career in 1984 as a revenue agent. I am very proud of my government service, and it is an honor for me to work alongside the dedicated men and women of the Internal Revenue Service. Our agency is vital to the functioning of government and keeping our economy strong. In our role as tax administrators, we collect 92 percent of all Federal <coughs> receipts, and last year we issued more than $330 billion in refunds to individual taxpayers. In my role as Deputy Commissioner, I oversee the support functions of the Internal Revenue Service, including technology, human capital, budget, real estate, physical security, and procurement. In February, the Committee sent the Department of Treasury a letter raising questions about two contracts that the IRS awarded in December 2012 to Strongcastle, one of the thousands of vendors that IRS does business with. One of the contracts was for computer equipment. Let me be clear, we have made no awards or purchases under that contract. The other involves licensing and product support for IBM software that is in use across the enterprise at IRS. Upon receipt of the Committee's letter, I immediately referred the matter to the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration. It is important to note that investigation is still ongoing. In mid-May, I was informed by TIGDA about inappropriate and unacceptable personal text messages sent by one of our procurement managers, Greg Roseman, to contractors doing business with the IRS from his personal phone. As soon as I became aware of the situation, I took steps to have Mr. Roseman reassigned to a non-supervisory position that does not involve the awarding or administration of contracts pending the outcome of the TIGD investigation. And then just yesterday, the committee released information related to this matter that the Internal Revenue Service had not been previously apprised of. This new information is deeply troubling, and it raises additional questions that TIGDA and the Internal Revenue Service must investigate. Let me be clear. These types of communications should not, should not occur between a procurement employee and a contractor. We expect all of our employees to act with professionalism and integrity. We are taking steps to separate the IRS from any ongoing business relationship with Strongcastle, subject to our need to safeguard our mission-critical resources. Under the teaming agreement with IBM that has been uh, talked about in the, the day since the report was missed, 
uh, was issued. There is a number that is rolling around about Strong Castle receiving $500 million potentially an award from that contract. Let me be clear. Strong Castle has not received anywhere near that amount of money from the software teaming arrangement. In fact, 98 percent of the value of that contract, if, if it was awarded, would go direct to IBM. But as I mentioned, we are taking steps to sever this relationship with, with Strong Castle. In response to the Committee's February letter, I also directed officials within our procurement office and the Office of Chief Counsel to review the documentation and correspondence related to these two contracts. In addition, as a result of the issues that have sur surfaced from the Committee inquiry, we are doing a top-to-bottom review of procurement policies and procedures everything from internal controls to business processes and staffing practices. I have also asked the Department of Treasury to expand its routine assessment of IRS procurement to include a review of small business programs. Based on the troubling um, information that we have received, we will also further enhance employee training with regard to ethics with a focus on gift rules, conflicts of interest, impartiality and the appearance of impropriety, and misuse of official position. Let me be clear that I have not seen anything within our procurement organization, and I think this is also backed up by the extensive interviews the committees have done with a host of IRS procurement officials, inappropriate behavior, behavior on the part of any other IRS procurement employee. These are 400 hardworking and, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, our procurement community has a strong ethics and wants to support our agency. Bottom line, we will continue to work with the Committee to provide you with updates on the results of our continuing review and partnership with TIGDA. And we also, we also would implore the Committee to please share with us the full set of information that you have obtained in your interviews, because I do believe it would greatly assist the Internal Revenue Service as well as the Treasury Inspector General in bringing this matter to conclusion. With that, I conclude my statement, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And I will break with tradition just to note, since you made a direct request, that uh, it is our intention to share fully with the IG this information. I must admit that it has been a one-way street. We are still waiting on an awful lot of documents from the IRS that are long overdue. Mr. Sisk. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the Committee. My name is Bill Sisk, and I am the Acting Deputy Commissioner of GSA's Federal Acquisition Service. I have spent over 20 years at GSA. I started in GSA's regional office in Atlanta in 1990 and I have served in a number of management positions, including Assistant Regional Administrator and Regional Commissioner. In my capacity as Regional Commissioner, I represented GSA's Assisted Acquisition Services, Network Services, and Personal Property. I have also served as Assistant Commissioner in the Office of General Supplies and Services within the Federal Acquisition Service, and was appointed to the U.S. Ability One Commission which is a unique program that provides employment opportunities for individuals who are blind or, other, or who have other significant disabilities. I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today to discuss GSA's Information Technology Schedule 70 program and the process by which GSA reviews Schedule 70 applications. IT Schedule 70 is the largest, most widely used acquisition vehicle in the Federal Government. Schedule 70 is an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, multiple award schedule providing direct access to IT products and services from private sector partners around the country. There are currently 4,853 businesses under Schedule 70, and 4,172 of these, more than 85 percent, are small businesses. Many of these small businesses have socioeconomic designations. 720 are 8A, 128 are hub zone, 381 are service-disabled, veteran-owned, 333 are veteran-owned, and 1,027 are women-owned. Through June of fiscal year 2013, about $11.5 billion worth of procurement has gone through Schedule 70, and $4.5 billion of that, 39 percent, went to small business. 
Schedule 70 has helped Federal agencies save time and money while ensuring a good value in the, avail in the available goods and services. In addition, Schedule 70 is one of the two schedules that is available to State and local governments through the Cooperative Purchasing Program, allowing them to leverage the buying power of the Federal Government to procure IT goods and services at competitive prices. By allowing our partner agencies to purchase from pre-approved vendors, they can receive goods and services faster. While having a scheduled contract is not the only way to do business with the government, having a scheduled contract allows both vendors and agencies to cut down on administrative costs. Cost savings are also generated through pre-negotiated price ceilings, which provide significant discounts from commercial pricing, and serve as a starting point for additional competition and negotiations. GSA has an established process by which to evaluate applications and make a determination of whether or not to approve businesses to get on schedule. Over the past three years, GSA has processed approximately 2,800 applications for Schedule 70. Currently, the average application processing time is approximately 110 days. Contractors can apply through GSA's eOffer system. eOffer provides an online paperless contracting environment in a step-by-step -step process that complies with the Federal Acquisition Regulation. After an offer package is submitted electronically into our system, it is then assigned to a contracting officer or contract specialist who reviews the package for completeness. After the initial review, the contracting officer or contract specialist sends the offerer an administrative letter identifying any areas for which additional information is required. When a package is complete, the contracting officer or contracts, contracting specialist conducts a responsibility determination using FAR Part 9 together with GSA's in-house pricing tool or by submitting a standard Form 1403 to GSA's Office of Credit and Finance for review and approval. In the review, the contracting officer or contracting specialist will also utilize the system for award management to review an offeror's representations, certifications, past awards and performance, and to ensure that all information is correct, accurate and complete. After the responsibility determination is complete, the CO or CS prepares a pre-negotiation memorandum outlining negotiation strategy and any remaining deficiencies. If negotiations are successful, a final proposal re uh, revision letter is sent to the offeror. If the offeror accepts the FBR, the CO or CS conducts a final review of the offer and prepares and finalizes the price negotiation memorandum. After all the required forms and additional information are completed and signed, the CO or CS inputs the offer into our system and prepares a package to send to the vendor. GSA Schedule 70 can be an important tool in meeting the IT needs of Federal agencies, and GSA has an established process to thoroughly review these applications in a timely fashion. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Castillo. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the Committee, my name is Braulio Castillo. I am President and CEO of Strong Castle, Inc. In January 2012, my wife and I purchased a small company called Signet Computers, Inc. At that time, Signet had over eight, 15 years of experience as a government contractor. Because I have significant experience serving the IT needs of the IRS, our plan was to transform Signet into a small business that initially focused on IRS IT procurements. When we considered how we could best position the company to support the agency, we came to learn that the IRS desired to award uh, contracts to small businesses and decided to pursue HUBZone and service disabled veteran owned small business credentials. We have never received any improper preferential treatment and we have competed fairly for every IRS contract that we received. In the short time frame that we have owned Strong Castle, our company has made meaningful contributions to the IRS mission and offered the government cost-effective solutions to very difficult problems. We have also been instrumental in forming teams with large software and hardware suppliers and the IRS. In order to improve the company's competitive posture in early 2012, as we began working with the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Small Business Administration to have Strong Castle qualified as a service-disabled veteran-owned small business concern and a hub-zone business concern. We understood that these credentials were important because the IRS's increased focus on awarding contracts to small business. In order to achieve small business participation goals, the IRS drafted some solicitation to give favorable consideration to qualified SDVOSB and hub zone concerns. In order to compete, we approached the VA and the SBA to apply for SDVOSB verification and hub zone certification. 
we work closely with the VA and the SBA throughout the application process. For example, we attended multiple HUBZone boot camps, presentations at which representatives of the HUBZone office were speakers. After meeting them, we continue to communicate frequently and regularly with them, often on a daily basis. The SBA advised us on all aspects of our HUBZone qualification, including the establishment of a principal office in a HUBZone and the hiring of college student employees. Because we believe the HUBZone status would be a significant benefit to the company, we consulted with the SBA on every detail of our application and plans. We have worked diligently at enormous personal and financial expense to cooperate with the investigation and to respond to all of the committee's requests for documents. So far, we have produced over 20,000 documents, including business records, email communications, text messages, and personal information. The cost of our effort to cooperate with the committee has been tremendous. The mischaracterization of the facts have caused Strong Castle to lose contracting partners, lines of credit, and goodwill among our important customers. It has hurt our reputation. Having responded to the committee's request for documentations, I believe that we have addressed the central issues of the interests of the committee. First, it is not true that Strong Castle received $500 million in IRS contracts. Strong Castle successfully competed for blanket purchase agreements pursuant to which the IRS may or may not issue subsequent orders. In reality, Strong Castle has received from the IRS uh, valued uh, contracts of approximately $50 million, for which, as Ms. Tucker previously mentioned, $49 million went to the large business providers. Of that amount, uh, and approximately $1 million to Strong Castle. Last year, our company lost approximately $140,000. Second, it is simply not true that Strong Castle had no track record of past performance on government contracts. The company that we purchased had experience contracting with the government, and I personally have worked with the IRS for almost 15 years. My prior experience is directly relevant to the work that we perform at the IRS. As a company, Strong Castle is uniquely qualified to serve the IRS based on our years of past performance. Third, Strong Castle has not received inappropriate preferral tre treatment from the IRS. We competed fairly for each blanket purchase agreement and any contract order that we received. To my knowledge, Strong Castle has never received any contract award to, as a result of inappropriate preferential treatment. Four, Strong Castle has been entirely open, truthful, and forthcoming with the SBA. Because obtaining HUBZone status was significantly important to the company, we took extreme care to work closely in consultation with the HUBZone office and sought approval and guidance throughout the certification process. Strong Castle has not sought, nor has it received unfair advantage in its pursuit of any government contract. We are a responsible small business. Unfortunately, other companies are able to use status challenges as competitive weapons against us. Despite these challenges, Strong Castle remains committed to delivering results as a valued small business partner to the United States and the IRS, as I have done for nearly 15 years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Castillo, you talked about the experience of your company in 15 years. How many common employees do you have? In other words, how many employees at, the fir at your firm have been there 15 years? No one has been there 15 years. 10 years? Of the employees. 10 years? Uh, none of them have been there 10 years. Five years? Um, I don't believe anyone. Well, we one year? One year. Uh, the, all of them have been there one year or less. We acquired so, so the, we acquired your, the no, company second. in January of no, this no. year. You made a st an assertion of prior experience. The fact is the company you bought and the employees of your current company have nothing in common. So where, I ran a company. I built a company over 20 years. Where is that legacy experience that you are claiming your company has? Name an employee that when you bought the company that had never done more than 250000 in contracting. Name the employee that is part of that experience that is with you here today. Of what timeline, sir? Well, you claimed 15 years. You bought the company uh, a year and a half ago. How many employees came when you bought the company? Uh, two employees and the owner at the time. And where are they today? Uh, the owner left in September of last year. and. One of the two we bought a small company with two employees. One of them is still there. Okay. One well, I just just I want the public to understand. You're claiming this experience and legacy, and now you're claiming that, in reality, three employees gross, one with the employer, only one of which is with you today. So, quite frankly, uh, you swore an oath to tell the truth and the whole truth. That's shading the truth pretty close uh, to claim 15 years of experience with. Uh, essentially no employees for all practical purposes. Ms. Tucker, uh, 
our committee, back when we sent the letter to you and uh, or to the acting uh, Treasury Secretary, and you got involved in it back in February and March, uh, we asked uh, you uh, about this, and at that time you said there was no there there. Uh, do you stand by that today in the case of this investigation? No, sir, I don't. Turn your mic on, please. No, sir, I, let, me, let me just be clear. Um, the information that we have seen about the personal relationship with Mr. Roseman and Mr. Castillo is inappropriate. Um, Mr. Roseman should have recused himself immediately from any involvement whatsoever in any IRS interactions with Strong Castle. Let me be clear also, and I think um, as your staff members interviewed uh, extensively IRS procurement officials, that they all stated on the record that they were unaware of any relationship with Mr. Roseman. No, no, I understand. And, and you know, and, you, and, Ms. And, Tuck, Ms. Tucker, you can't have it both ways. You can't say you don't know what our people said. Well, your lawyers were in those interviews and then start saying what your people said in our interviews. So let me use my time more briefly. Just this past Monday, you indicated you were not going to cancel the $266 million contract to, to Strong Castle. Uh, my understanding a, minute, a few minutes ago is you now are going to cancel that or put it on hold. It is not so important as to not be reworked. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, what I told members of your staff on Monday was that we were exploring options. Okay. Well, now let's get to this part about the money. When you provide a contract, when the Federal Government and your other witnesses are hopefully helpful, when you provide a, a contract to a disabled veteran like Mr. Casile and to in a hub zone, the IRS, as I understand it, took full credit for this hundreds of millions of dollars as though they went to that company. Isn't that true? You didn't take credit for 1 percent of it going to a disabled veteran in a small business in a hub zone. You took credit for 500 million. Isn't that correct? Mr. Chairman, Internal Revenue Service followed the Ma'am, you are you're not a witness that I am terribly thrilled at today because you did ignore this until we pressed and pressed and pressed. The fact is, and I will go to Mr. Uh, well, either of other two witnesses, Mr. Flora and Mr. Chodos, when the IRS awards $500 million, they don't do it on the net that might go, if you will, the skimmed off the top profit for absolutely no participation in the actual delivery of services. They take the gross amount, don't they? This is scored as hundreds of millions of dollars going to a hub zone. Isn't that correct? Mr. Chairman, the, the ultimate credit for the contract is for the dollars incurred, and the dollars incurred are gross. So okay. So for the American people here today, one of the frauds on the American people and, and for us on the dais is we get these report cards talking about hundreds of millions and billions of dollars going to our disabled veterans, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars going into these blighted zones that we are trying to encourage. I call them enterprise zones. Hub zone happens to be one form of it. We are scoring $500 million, and then somebody comes here, Ms. Ducker, I am picking on you for a reason, and tries to say, well, it is minuscule. Our indication is that this contract cost more than it would have cost if it had been competitively bid to the principals, and clearly every cent that Mr. Castillo got, from what we can tell, without having a true principal operation, and, our, and the witnesses did make it pretty clear, they don't go there. The people who had real money don't go there. A few college students show up and, and surf the Internet looking for potential new contracts. That in fact, was scored as hundreds of millions of dollars to help people in blighted areas and to help a disabled veteran who, it turns out, played college ball for years and didn't limp or have a problem until he got ready to apply for this special status. I have a scoring problem here today, and I think my ranking member and everyone on the dais, and Mr. Flora, you didn't get a chance, and I'm going to go to the ranking member now, but bear in mind it is not about Mr. Castillo per se. He may not have broken a single rule. That is for others to determine under the law. But we were shocked to discover that we are scoring as though we are doing a lot of good for disabled veterans, not pre people who 
turn their ankle and have no problem for 27 years until it is time to conveniently become a disabled veteran and we were scoring impact to blighted communities when in fact that score is at best fraudulent we are scoring apparently $1 million, but writing it in as 10 times or 100 times that. So that is part of what this hearing is here today. That is what the ranking member and I, why we are teammates in this. This is an example of an agency that conveniently had a large contract, may or may not have gotten the best value for the American taxpayer, but certainly for the two gentlemen on, on, to your left or your right, Ms. Tucker, they are in a position where complying with the law they are, in fact, not seeing you deliver the value appropriately to the American people for these set-aside type events. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Tuck, I want to just pick up where the Chairman left off. Help me with this. Um, you apparently had not made a decision on an IBM contract on Monday. Is that right? That is correct. We were, we were exploring options. We were troubled, mm -hmm. but we had not immediately canceled the contract because the IBM software mm -hmm. is critical to our mainframe operation. I understand. So what happened, what information came to you between Monday and this morning that caused you to say what you said? And when was that decision made? to sever the relationships. I, I, if I am misstating you, tell me. I think that is what you said. Yeah. So um, yesterday afternoon, uh, when we received the report from the committee and the procurement executive team um, and I met, and based on the email exchanges that we are seeing in the report that we had not been made privy to, um, and candidly, based on the fact that Mr. Roseman was repeatedly asked by his superiors if he had a personal relationship with Mr. Casillo and Strongcastle, and he denied it. And I believe uh, the detail that we saw excerpted in the report has raised considerable concern that we are in the process of separating um, our relationship with Strongcastle. Would the gentleman yield for a second? I will give you additional time. Sure. Ms. Tucker, I, I only want to make sure that the ranking member understands the emails you are so horrified about, you gave us. That was part of the discovery. Your organization reads them before they deliver them to us. Thank no, you, Mr. No, sir, that is incorrect. That is not the email that I am referring to. We did provide emails from the Internal Revenue Service system. The so, the, so the emails that you provided did not lead you, were not enough to get you to feel that they, there should be a severing. Is that right? Correct. Now, some additional emails came in. It is actually text messages. Text messages, right. Um, as I said in my opening statement, it is text messages in the from, report. from Mr. Mr. Roseman's personal phone to Mr. Castillo that had not been shared with the Internal Revenue Service and that we were unaware of. So that basically was the straw that broke the camel's back. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Chodos, tell me, t just very briefly, because I, I got to talk to Mr. Castillo, tell me um, how many decertifications you have done, you all have done, do you know, over the last four or five years? You give, you give, give us any idea. I am trying to figure out how unique this is. Decertification. Uh, thank you, Representative Cummings. I can get you. Thank you, Representative Cummings. I can get you a full spread for the last five years of all decertifications. I believe we've decertified approximately 1,500 or 1,600 firms over the course of the last year. Some of those have been due to changes in the hub zone qualified census tract maps. Some of those have been due to specific issues with particular companies. Now, Mr. Costello, I, I reviewed your testimony, and I have to admit that I am troubled because you seem to take no personal responsibility for any of your, your own actions. In fact, you criticize everyone else but yourself. You even blame your current problems on, let me quote this, the volatile business and political environment of the day, whatever that means. I would like to read from the letter that SBA sent to you on May 23rd 
about one month ago, formally notifying you that your company's hub zone uh, status was revoked. Then I'd like to get your response. The SBA letter says that you, and I quote, admitted that records provided were false and inaccurate. I want you to put a pin on that. It says you, and it says you quote, did not provide SBA with reliable and accurate payroll records, end of quote. It says you do not have, quote, adequate internal controls, end of quote. It says that you tried to claim that your program manager, quote, is not an employee at all, but rather a contractor, end of quote. It says you have, quote, a fictitious uh, attitude with regard to the accuracy of records, end of quote. You know, Michael Jackson had the song, you need, The Man in the Mirror. You need to look in the mirror. Um, it says your employees, quote, can record time worked as they please, when we all like to have that job. So with all of that, Ms. Costello, let, let me now give you a chance to respond. Do you admit that you submitted false records to SBA? SBA did decertify us based on the records, and we have put measures in place to address some of those concerns. That is not yeah. what I asked you. Did do you admit that you submitted false records to SBA? Yes. How do you respond to other allegations? Uh, well, the SBA letter states that you only corrected these errors, and I quote, after being confronted with conflicting evidence presented by SBA. So there weren't uh, problems you were identifying, were they? No, sir. They identified them and we corrected them. And so, Mr. Chodos, let me turn to you. You are here representing SBA. So what is your response to Mrs. Costello? Do you stand by your findings? Yes. Yes, Representative Cummings. The SBA stands by its findings that the decertification was justified under these facts. And so going back to you, Mr. Castillo, uh, what do you say about the SBA saying that you, had, uh, you did not have adequate internal controls? I mean, what is your response to that? I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Sure. Y yes, sir. Because you, 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 there are some problems here. Yeah. Y yes, sir. So they pointed out some inaccuracies and we put some corrections in place from a time recording perspective. And so, so you admit that, that there were some problems with internal controls? Yes, sir. I'm now, now let me get to something that the Chairman talked about that, that is extremely troubling to me. You know, I told you in my opening statement that I live in an area where a black male unemployment is probably 25, 30 percent. I live in a hub zone type area uh, where businesses are, businesses are struggling. So I want the programs to work properly, as I know the Chairman does. The question is, um, can you tell me, outside of the Catholic University uh, students and faculty, tell me how many other people outside of those that you empl uh, employed uh, from the, the, the hub zone? Of our 10 employees, sir, not counting the college students, we have one other hub zone resident. So you had, a, you had 10 employees. Y yes, sir. And are you telling me nine of them were from Catholic University? No, sir. Uh, what I was saying, we have a, approximately 10 employees. Uh -huh. About five of them, to, per your count, are from Catholic University. One of them is from, not counting the Catholic students, is from a hub zone. When did you hire that person? Uh, May of this year. Oh, so, you, oh, oh, oh. oh. You, you, you just hired her? Uh, yes, sir. We disclosed that to the committee during okay. my, my transcribed interview. Yes, sir. Then I guess if you were in my district, the folks that I'm talking about would not, they, would, they wouldn't get a job for you unless they were at Catholic University, huh? Hello? No, sir. I would not agree with that characterization. All right. Let me, let me ask you a moment, just one other question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Costello, it seems clear from the evidence that you wanted to take full advantage of the Hub Zone program. Uh, and not to help D.C. residents or underutilized neighborhoods. 
but to maximize your own profits. During your, your transcribed interview with the committee staff, you said this, and I quote, I knew that HUBZone was important, being from the industry, and so we went at it that way, end of quote. That's what you said. Is that right? It's, I, I don't recall saying it, but yes, I stand by that. And now, finally, what does that mean? What did you mean by that? We moved our operations from Northern Virginia to Washington, D.C., in a certified hub zone and um, established our principal office there. That is what I mean by that, sir. Right. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, would the gentleman yield for just one moment? Mr. Castillo, just straight yes or no, because we have your interviews, your wife's interviews, and so on. Isn't it true that all the high paid people who potentially sell or work on that contract live and effectively work elsewhere, that the testimony of yours, your wife, and other principals is that they don't often go to that principal location, that in fact it isn't manned full time, and that when it is manned it was mostly by college students who were looking for other, other contract potential and not executing in this contract, that your accounting operation and all those sort of key functions somebody would think of as corporate headquarters were never located in that building? So there was a few things in there, so I will try to address them, sir. So you are right. Uh, the principal workers, I think you would say the type A workers, um, all work on site at the government site. They don't report to an office like in many other companies. Right. So, so the, the, I mean, maybe I will cut this yeah. down because I am really on borrowed yes, time. Sir. You don't work out of that office. Your wife doesn't work out of this, that office. Those previous uh, individuals that were from the previous company don't even live in the area. One lives in Boston, one lives in Florida. Uh, that, in fact, when we really look at it, the college, for during the execution of this contract thus far until a few days ago, basically college students showed up there and surfed a few sites. Uh, which was not a direct part of any execution of this contract. Isn't that true, that the hub zone headquarters was in name only? It was not your principal place that you did business executing these contracts? By you, do you mean me, sir? I mean you, your wife, or anybody other than these college students. Yeah, I work out of our Leesburg hub zone location. Uh, my wife works out of our home. Uh, as her in the richest county in the country, Loudoun, right? Uh, uh, yes, sir, I think I read that. Um, tending to our five children, uh, four of them which are under the age of 10 or under. Uh, the college students and any other worker that reported to an office reports to the Washington, D.C. office, which is why SBA established that as our principal office. We did have, as you mentioned, an employee from Florida, a former IRS executive who lives there, uh, who retired to that area. And the gentleman that you are referring to in Boston actually works on a top secret facility in Hanscom Air Force Base. So, that is located in Boston and on site at the client site. Yeah, uh, just, one, I, I, just one last of question, course, Chairman. Just based on what the Chairman just said, I want you to re I want to remind you that you're under oath, and I want to ask you this question: Don't you think you manipulated uh, this process and frustrated the true purpose of this program? No, sir. And why do you say that? I don't feel I manipulated it. That's why I said that. You just admitted that you lied with regard to the accuracy of, of information. Well, to your point, in a direct yes, no, we provided inaccurate information uh, on our timesheets, not on our payroll statements, um, which we shared and have corrected since and put processes in place to correct them, sir. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mike is here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tucker, uh, your title is uh, Deputy Commissioner for Operations Support. So you oversee uh, the procurement process uh, for IRS and personnel involved in that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you gave a, a statement, uh, I guess pretty much waving the flag in support of some of IRS actions. And I'm sure there are thousands of people who every day um, get up and do a good, good job for IRS. But uh, representing people in a district in Florida and just um, anywhere I go, I hear more complaints about the IRS. Uh, uh, I think you've been in a sort of a meltdown of scandals, uh, the targeting of um, certain political organizations. Um, we held a hearing a few weeks ago on conferences um, gone wild, uh, spending uh, with the IRS. 
I think on the wire today there is a story about credit card abuses. I don't know if you oversee that. Do you see that, too? Yes, that is yeah. part of our procurement yeah. organization. Well, that, that uh, again, is uh, just an embarrassment. This uh, hearing uh, on uh, a procurement that uh, uh, process that, uh, again, has uh, gotten out of hand, I think we have lost uh, great confidence, and probably for very good reason. Um, it sounds like uh, Mr. Castillo has sort of gamed the system. Would you agree? Based on my understanding. Well, um, okay, let me ask you a question. Let's go back to before the committee contacted you about this, had, had you or any of uh, employees of IRS, uh, had you all been contacted about what was going on with Mr. Castillo and Mr. Roseman? Yes, sir. Let me. Let wait, me. wait. My question was before the committee con uh, contacted you on the matter of of this relationship, were you or any of the employees, are you aware of them, uh, notified that something was going on? No, with sir. Absolutely no. No, sir. Okay. And uh, since then, you have been rather reluctant until you have had the awakening just in the last uh, few days that something uh, was going wrong, had gone wrong here. Mr. Chodos, uh, does it sound like uh, uh, SBA was gamed by this player? Uh, Congressman, it appears from what we know. Well, he just told you he provided you inaccurate information. Yes, and as a result okay. of learning that the information mm -hmm. was, in fact, inaccurate, I mean, it is a pretty fundamental okay. principle that we have certified so entities. He, they have to provide us accurate information. You agree he gamed you. Uh, now, Mr. Castillo, you, it appears you also gamed uh, the Veterans Administration. Uh, we want our veterans with disabilities to have some special preference and standing. Um, the only incidence of uh, a disability was, an, um, was it prep school, was it? Uh, was there anything in active military service where you sustained a disability or injury? The, the injury that um, I sustained was during my uh, time at the prep school. But I, that was my question. A question, did you sustain an injury, uh, again, in active military service, uh, or were you disabled during that time? So I, I, I'm not sure. In active military service, were you in combat were, uh, uh, and, and uh, had an injury? Were no, my, time, my injury is not combat related, job. sir. Okay. It, it was during my active Mr. duty with the Mr. Floor, the it sounds board. like he's gamed the system. Would you agree? Sir, uh, come on. Tell, uh, yes or no? Has he gamed the system? Based well, on discussions, sir, that we had with your staff last week, we are not able to provide specific information regarding this claim. It sounds to me. Release. Okay, it sounds to me, Mr. Fleur, like he's gamed the system. That's not what we intend. What Congress intended. I'm sad that VA can't make that determination and say so publicly. Let, let me just. Uh, also say, uh, Mr. Castillo, you had uh, a few contacts or a number of contacts, uh, either by phone, by text, cell phone text, uh, or uh, other contacts with uh, Mr. Roseman. Uh, how would you uh, sell uh, cell phone contacts? Were they a few, um, many, um, texts, a uh, few, many, uh, observe, uh, meetings, uh, a few, many? Uh, I probably have met with them over the last five years about ten times or so, uh -huh. and um, there were there were text messages where we provided to the committee as part of the investigation. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, he just testified uh, again a few times between May and October. You and Mr. Roseman exchanged over a hundred telephone calls. Uh, don't you think that that's in excess of what you just testified to? I, I don't believe there were telephone calls. I think you are referring to text messages. Is that right, Well, sir? again, we have uh, phone calls or uh, through the uh, texting uh, over 100 messages. And then, uh, in particular, you had a 21-minute telephone conversation between Mr. Roseman and yourself on the 7th of, of uh, June 2012 
And uh, to refresh your memory, that was the night before Mr. Roseman sent you the request for a quote uh, for an $80 million uh, laptop desktop acquisition. So one, you testified or you just indicated you had very few contacts, contrary to a, a hundred, over 100 uh, contacts by phone that we have. And secondly, did you want, and finally, do you want to comment on your 21 minute conversation with Mr. Roseman prior? The gentleman's time has expired. Would you please, please answer? I believe I testified that I met with him about 10 times or so for the last um, five years. I didn't comment on the number. I think I stated that I believe you're referring to text messages versus, that we turned over versus telephone. Chairman, I asked briefly. about cell or phone, text, and meetings, three different. Uh, so, du duly noted. I don't know the number of telephone calls. I believe the text message I'm very much aware with because I met with committee staffers or and council last week or so, and we went over them of the ones that we provided. And I don't recall what the conversation was about on June seventh. Sorry. Be before, as I go to Ms. Norton, uh, Mr. Casello, I know Mr. Roseman said there wasn't a friendship. I believe you have repeatedly said there was. You haven't been uh, quite as you've been on the opposite side of that. So these texts are not on. Uh, unexpected in that you said you do have a long relationship with Mr. Roseman. I have worked in support of the, uh, the IRS for about 15 years or so. Uh, the last 10 years, I mean, uh, since, but since 2003, 2003, he's been, a, he's been what you would characterize as a friend. I would say a customer. I met him through my previous employer where they were very, very good friends. And we held the contract there at my previous employer, which was a small Okay, so small customer, small customer, not friend, is your testimony today? No, sir, I didn't say that because I think I'm on record of saying. So he, we have a business relationship that I believe he is, uh, that we're friendly or friends. So I'm, I'm not changing my testimony that I believe that. Well, I, I think Mr. Micah was trying to get to the question based on this communication, because we do have a witness not here today, who has said to the IRS that. They're, that you were not friends, yes or no, are you friends under your definition of friends? Uh, yes, I would think I have been clear, I mean, or I have stated that several uh, times. Thank you. I just want to make sure, because I know the Treasury wants to understand the disparity in interpretation of friends between an individual who did not disclose and yourself. And I am not trying to put anyone in the spot. I just I think Mr. Micah deserves a yes or no on, on, on that. I am not sure he asked me if we were friends or if I characterized it. So based on my 10 years of working with him, uh, I would say we have a, a, a good business relationship and I would consider him a friend under my definition. Uh, but to be clear, uh, I wish he was here to testify. I am a small business owner of 10 or so folks and I am here willingly and I have actively participated. I have attended everything that you have asked me to attend. Um, we have made every employee available to you. We have turned over an immense amount of documents, including the text messages that you reference. And I would say that we have fully have cooperated or have tried well, to do so. And, and this is not my time, so Ms. Norton, if you would be indulgent for one more moment. Uh, we have no objection to exactly that. From the, from the get-go, you have come in and asserted that you believe you did nothing wrong. One of the reasons for this hearing today is we believed from an IRS execution of the contract, it was not appropriate, and you know we inter intervened when we believed that. And obviously, we have the SBA uh, here today and the veterans here today because we believe that there needs to be a reform in a portion of the process under which you were uh, given these statuses. And those are the three points here today. But I do appreciate, and I want to note for the record that yes. From the get-go, you have come in and said, I don't believe I did anything wrong, I will cooperate, and you have. Ms. Norton, thank you for your indulgence. Yes, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me preface um, my question um, by uh, indicating that when this program was uh, initiated in the late 90s, I think 1997, uh, it was done without hearings. Um, the Republican Senator from Missouri, Chris Bond, inserted it into an SBA reauthorization. Uh, and it seemed like a good idea. It seemed to bring together um, really some of the visions of one of my good friends, the late Jack Kemp, who, to marry his notions of, uh, of the market system and capitalism with his concern for the inner city. 
By the time uh, the uh, Democrats took control of the Congress, it's Valesquez was so disgusted with the program because there had been hearings in all the major cities showing terrible abuse by large companies uh, of, uh, the, of the Hub Zone program. And some of us went to Needy and said, well, you know, it's a new president, give him a chance to clean it up. I don't have any evidence that, that the program is still like it was when those hearings were held throughout the United States showing that big companies had uh, wholesalely abused the notion. Um, but obviously, uh, and so I do think the program must have improved or else we would have heard more about that by this time. But I can't say the same for what I'm hearing today. I have to tell you, Mr. Castillo, that this hits a bit close to home. Uh, you, of course, don't live in D.C. That's allowed. You're from a wealthy Virginia suburb. That's allowed. You rented a tiny office in uh, Chinatown. And then you recruited students from Catholic University to do the work after you received the contract. Why didn't you go towards seven and eight, which, of course, is the part of the city, if you were not going to do it in your own hub zone, which is a part of the city where employment is high, it's classically a part of the city where, where you could have found people to do the work, uh, and, and fully met the notion embodied in the hub zone that people who live in disadvantaged areas would have some investment in the area and could get employment whereas they could not before. Why didn't you go to Ward 7 and 8 instead of going to Catholic University? Uh, so, ma'am, I don't know uh, the wards very well. I, I apologize. I'm not uh, well. Uh, well, uh, well, you know it well uh, enough to go to Catholic University. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, and, and ma'am, just to state, uh, the, the college employees that we hired were hired before we, uh, the awards. Um, we put together two initiatives. One. Whether they were hired before or after the awards, the purpose of the, of the hub zone is to hire disadvantaged people. Were these Catholic University students disadvantaged people? Uh, they are residents of a hub zone um, that we employed. Uh, you say in your testimony all of our actions were taken in consultation with the S SBA and we have never sought to deceive the government. Do you believe that hiring uh, College students go to an expensive private university uh, is in keeping with the, the, um, the goals of this program? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Uh, Chados, do you believe that hiring students uh, who go to a private university, expensive one at that, is in keeping with the goals of the program? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Norton, uh, Norton, the answer to your question is this. The Hub Zone program, as you have said, is designed to spur investment in and economic development in place based. Do you believe that the hiring of students at a private university meets the goals of the Hub Zone program? We have seen many entities throughout time that hire students, many students, of course take on great debt in order to better themselves and their families. He had hired no students except, until recently, except uh, he has hired no employees except students from this zone. And then we learned in May he did, in fact, hire uh, someone who was not a Catholic University student. Now, we have, I love Catholic University. I, I'm trying to marry what the, what, what the zone is about with the actions that were taken here. And I want to know whether uh, you believe uh, and whether SBA believes this is in keeping with what the goals of the program. So long as they are residents of the community. And so as far as you there. know, throughout the United States, people are going and finding people who are by definition advantage because they have gotten to college, which most Americans do not, and they may be hiring college students all over the United States rather than bona fide residents. You don't even know that these Catholic University students were, were residents of the District of Columbia while they live here. 
they, of course, are residents. They either live in the dormitories or in the surrounding neighborhoods. We're glad to have them. But you don't even know that they are residents of the city uh, or that they meet the notions of disadvantage embodied in the, home, in the, in the hub zone itself. Well, what we know is what they certify to us, which is that they are residents and are planning to live well, in the hub zone. I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask uh, whether or not you'd be willing uh, to, 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 um, to uh, uh, um, ask hub zone um, recipients, hub zone contract recipients, whether they hire college students so that we will know how widespread this practice is. Well, let me say this. We agree with you completely. The purpose of the program is not to focus upon college students. It is to focus upon employment in these places. But and you can't out. say today that that isn't the practice not only of Mr. Castillo, but of many like Mr. Castillo across the United States. I can say that the practice occurs in various places at various times. I do not have the data, and I can see could, if the data is available would you about see if exactly the, how many employees I would very much appreciate your seeing if the, data, if the data is available. I think a simple questionnaire, <laughs> how many of your, your employees are college students, would help us uh, to make sure that the Chairman said we, want, we wanted to have uh, uh, the needed reforms. That there may be no, no sense until this case came up. That, that that could amount to an abuse. I, look, I, I'm, I'm not against the college students. I'm saying if it is a systematic practice, you can see what the effect would be uh, if, if, if the purpose was to make sure that disadvantaged people in the neighborhood were employed. So I ask that you submit within 30 days uh, whatever you can find on that. And, and Mr. Uh, one more, one more question, if I may. Mr. Castillo, you indicated that um, something about most of the money went to the parent company or to the large company, but you made a million dollars? Your company made a million dollars? What is the value of your company? Last year, uh, last year we reported $8 million in sales and we lost one hundred and forty. Thousand dollars based on those sales, but you just testified that forty-nine million. But you, your company, got a million of that. Yes, ma'am. In gross profits, not in net profits. Yeah. Well, so I just uh, submit. I, I, sub, I just submit for a eight million dollar uh, company, one million dollar from, from one million dollars from one contract is very lucrative. Or as you said in one of your emails to, to your to your wife, pay dirt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. And, and I, I might note for the record that uh, as a small businessman for many years, uh, if I chose to pay myself no salary, I might make half a million dollars. And if I sold, chose to pay myself half a million dollars, I might make no money. So with uh, Mr. Castillo and his wife as principal employees, uh, I, I wanted to be clear that the, the balance sheet and the income statement are somewhat uh, not the same as, let's say, uh, a Fortune 500 company's interpretation. That's why I wanted to know the worth of the company. Just yeah. The well, let, you it. know, it, it clearly without these contracts, it will be less. With that, we go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Ms. Tucker, you've been at the IRS 29 years. Yes, sir. And you're deputy commissioner. Is that correct? Deputy commissioner. How many deputy commissioners are there? Two. Is there anyone between the deputy commissioner and the commissioner? No. So you're you're right near the top. Yes, sir. Uh, one month ago, Inspector General Russell George gave the committee information that he informed the IRS on May 30, 2012, that targeting of conservative political groups was taking place. In fact, if we can put that up on the screen, uh, this is from the TIGDA timeline he gave this committee. And he says in that meeting, these terms were used, Tea Party Patriots 912, that there were three people in that committee uh, or in that meeting. Uh, Mr. Shulman, who is no longer with the IRS, Steve Miller, who has been fired, and you. Now, Mr. Shulman testified a month ago in this committee that that was the first time he knew targeting was taking place. Was that the first time you knew about the targeting at the IRS? That was the first time I was aware of the situation, yes. Now, Mr. Miller uh, has, has also, uh, and we have also been informed the committee through uh, uh, talking with Nan Marks, an employee at the IRS, that there was an internal investigation launched by Mr. Miller on, um, in March of 2012. Did you know about that internal investigation? No, sir. 
And the results of that were uh, Mr. Miller knew about what was going on May 3rd of 2012. Did you know the results on May 3rd? No, sir. So the earliest you knew about it was the same time Mr. Shulman testified and what you are testifying to today was May 30th of last year. Yes, sir. And you are familiar with the fact that Mr. Shulman testified in front of the Ways and Means Committee in March of last year where he said this. First, Mr. Bustani asked him, can you give us assurances that the IRS is not targeting political groups? Mr. Shulman said, yes, I can give you assurances. We pride ourselves on being nonpolitical, nonpartisan organizations. So just two months prior to learning that targeting was going on, he gave assurances. Now, there is usually, when you give assurances, there is some basis for assurances. Were you part of the basis for assurances that Mr. Shulman gave the Ways and Means Committee in March of 2012? No, sir. You did not have any conversation with Mr. Shulman before he went and uh, testified in front of the Ways and Means Committee? No, sir. In the meeting that took place on May 30th, the meeting that is uh, highlighted there on the TIGTA timeline, when you learned that the targeting was taking place, what was the reaction in that meeting? Was it, oh, sh you sugar, we got to do something here. This is, was it, we got to correct the record. We got, what was the reaction when the three top people at the IRS learned that this was going on? So if I might, um, TIGDA, the Treasury Inspector General, comes in once a month to meet with Cut to the chase. What was the reaction? You find out there is targeting of political groups six months before a presidential election. What was the reaction from the top three people at the IRS? TIGDA reported the information that they were looking into the audit. And then at that point in time, IRS waits for TIGDA to complete their investigation. That is not what they told you. They told you Tea Party, Patriot, 912 were identifying terms used to put groups on a list who were never given the tax exempt status they sought. In some cases, they have been trying to get it for three years. You learned that May, or, uh, excuse me, May 30, 2012, and your reaction was, oh, we will just kind of let it keep going and see what TIGDA comes up with? No, sir. I mean, earlier when your testimony, you said to the chairman, you said, you know, it would be helpful if this committee would share information with us at the IRS about the issue that is in front of the committee today. Well, it would have been helpful if once you got that information, you would have shared it with this committee. We would have liked to have, in fact, we are the committee who asked for the audit in the first place. We would have liked to have known six months before an election, May 30th of last year, that targeting was going on. Did you instruct Russell George to share this information with the House Ways and, or, uh, Ways and Means Committee and with the House Oversight Committee? Sir. So that is a question. Did you, did you tell Mr. George, you know what, this is pretty important information. We just now learned today, according to your testament, this is going on. Did you tell Mr. George, you know, you might want to share that with the Oversight Committee, specifically since Mr. Ice is the one who requested the audit? No, sir, that was not my responsibility. I have responsibility at Internal Revenue Service well, for let me our ask you this. support well, operations. No, but, but the point is, you were in the meeting. The other two guys are gone. Mr. Shulman has gone. Mr. Miller has been fired. You are the highest ranking official at IRS in that meeting. You knew about it a year ago. Didn't you think it was incumbent upon you to, to set the record straight? Your boss, Mr. Shulman, had just testified two months earlier and told Congress nothing was going on. He finds out two months later, in fact, it is going on. You are the highest ranking official still at the IRS. You didn't think it was appropriate to come tell Congress what, ha what, was, what was taking place? The T or TG organization does not report to me. Why didn't you correct the record? If you want to, why didn't you just come? Why didn't you come to, the, to Mr. Ice and say, you know what? What Mr. Shulman? Did you tell Mr. Shulman he should correct the record? No, sir, I did not. And well, let me ask you this: Have you been disciplined by Mr. Warfall for not correcting the record? No, sir, it's not in my purview. Well, your deputy commissioner, you're in the meeting. You learned about it that day, right? Mr. George told us in his routine monthly meeting that they were doing an investigation of TEGE. We understand that. All, all I'm asking is there has got to be some reason why you didn't feel at any obligation, any, any reason that you should come forward and set the record straight. The Inspector General told the IRS what was going on. You didn't feel like he should tell us or you didn't feel incumbent, uh, it was incumbent upon you to tell the committee? Sir, at the Internal Revenue Service, we have two deputy commissioners that have very clearly was, delineated uh, the rules and time responsibilities. Has uh, the gentlelady may finish. At the Internal Revenue Service, we have two deputy commissioners with very clearly delineated responsibilities. I do not have responsibility for the service and, and enforcement programs, well, as then, Mr. Ms. Miller Tucker. would not well, have. Then, Ms. Tucker, why were you in the meeting? 
If it has nothing to do with you, why did, why did, why did Mr. Uh, Russell George think it is important to tell us that you were in the meeting? Mr. George and his deputies come into Internal Revenue Service every month and brief on all of their investigations, some of which are service Chairman, and enforcement. Could, okay. uh, well, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I am sure, sure we will get back to this. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent. The man have 30 additional seconds. I, I, I don't mind the 30 seconds, but I wanted to be able to answer the question. Uh, as, I as, mean, he is like a, a machine gun, and he, she can't even get her answer out. Okay. The gentleman may have 30 additional seconds. The gentlelady made that answer. Please. In that meeting, did you discuss with Mr. So what you are saying is Mr. Miller had, uh, that was his area of jurisdiction? That is correct. Did you, did you tell Mr. Miller he should come forward and tell Congress what was going on? No, sir. At this meeting. Was that discussed? May, if, if I could, please. The meeting, TIGDA comes in once a month to Internal Revenue Service to brief the Commissioner and the two deputies about their audits, their open audits. On any given meeting that they come in, they could be talking. I mean, there are lots of oversight investigations that happen at Internal Revenue Service. Those meetings are typically TIGDA coming in and saying, we have opened an investigation on X program. We have opened an investigation on another program. If it is an issue that is under my jurisdiction, like procurement, like the IRS budget, like our real estate portfolio, then I am the respons responsible party. What I am what I'm trying to convey to you is I do not have oversight responsibility for the TEGE programs. Thank you. The gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Duckworth, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this hearing is, is very troubling to me because this case really shows how things can go wrong. I, I want to support our small business owners as much as possible. I want these set-asides to be successful, but I am absolutely appalled by the advantages that have been taken of the system. Mr. Floor, um, I know you cannot discuss Mr. Castillo's case because you would need his permission to discuss his particular case. That is why you could not answer the question earlier. Um, my understanding also is that the VA, VBA specifically, is bound by legislation that says um, a certain condition has a certain uh, disability rating. For example, a below knee amputation is 40 percent. It just is, correct? That is correct, ma'am. So it seems like there is uh, an opportunity here to, uh, for some legislative fixes to the this, to this system. Uh, Mr. Chodos, is it tr um, true that any rating, even if it is just 5 percent, would qualify someone for a service-connected dis um, disability? Service connected disability owned business? So long as they qualify under the VA's rules for service connected disability, that is adequate for the self certification. Thank you. Mr. Castillo, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I, I am not well, but you are welcome. All right. So, your foot hurt? Your left foot? Uh, yes, ma'am. It hurts. Yeah. My feet hurt too. In fact, mm, the balls of my feet burn continuously, and, and I feel like there is a nail being hammered into my right heel right now. So I can understand pain and suffering and, and how service connection can actually cause long-term unremitting, unyielding, unstoppable pain. Um, so I am sorry that twisting your ankle in high school has now come back to, to hurt you in um, such a painful way, if also opportune for you to gain the status for your business as you are trying to compete for contracts. Um, I also understand why um, you know, something can take years to manifest themselves from when you, you hurt them. Um, in fact, I have a dear, dear friend who sprayed Agent Orange out of his Huey in Vietnam, who it took 40 years, 40 years for the leukemia to actually manifest itself, and he died six months later. So I can see how military service, um, while at the time you seem very healthy, um, could 40 years later result in um, devastating injury. So can you tell me if you um, hurt your left foot again during your football career subsequently to um, twisting it in high school? Ma'am, I don't understand the high school comment. Uh, but the general lady, I, I, prep, I, prep, I, prep school, I, I, I apologize. post I, I, high school. I'm not post high school. Okay, post high school, prep school, before college, prep school. Did, did you injure your left foot again after prep school? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, ma'am. You played football in college, correct? Yes, ma'am. As a quarterback? Yes, ma'am. Did, did you hurt 
did you injure that, that same foot again subsequently in, in, in the years since you twisted it in prep school? Not to my recollection. Not to your recollection. Okay. Um, why didn't you, Mr. Castillo, tell the VA that your doctor's note to them was inaccurate when you knew that it was? I, I don't feel that it's inaccurate, ma'am. Okay. Um, Would you like me to address that? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. So, um, my one of my doctors that submitted letters. So, as part of uh, the injury, you have to establish that it's chronic and reoccurring. So, when I returned home to San Diego, my doctor from San Diego had also returned had had said that he treated me for the foot injury that I suffered on active duty. When I moved to Las Vegas a couple of years later. That doctor submitted that he continued to treat me for that uh, a left foot broken foot injury. Uh, finally, when I moved to Virginia, um, I I went to a doctor and that it continued to hurt. Okay. And he and he established that. Uh, so, Doctor Sam Wilson, um, who ironically was also stationed at Monmouth. Okay, I have to cut you off because I'm running out of okay. time. I'm sorry. So um, I just want to just so let me finish. So, in talking to Doctor Wilson, who himself is a disabled veteran and very familiar with mm -hmm. Fort Monmouth and that his son had went there as well mm -hmm. and, and played football. Um, he actually was the one that talked to me about, okay. hey, this may be uh, something that uh, is connected. And I believe I told him so that, let, let that me, I was first let, hurt, let me, hurt playing football. I have football to cut you off. I have and, to cut you off. Now, this is not an argument. I'm talking. Yes, I'm up here. Yes, let me ask you this. Do you feel that the 30 percent rating that you have for the scars and the pain in your foot is, is accurate to the sacrifices that you've made for this nation? That the VA decision is, is accurate in your case? Yes, ma'am, I do. You know, my right arm was essentially blown off and reattached. Um, I spent a year in limb salvage with over a dozen surgeries over that time period. And um, in fact, we thought we would lose my arm, and I'm still in danger of, of possibly losing my arm. I can't feel it. I can't feel my three fingers. My disability rating for that arm is 20%. In your letter to a government official, I think it's the SVA, um, attention, Gina Mu, you said, my family and I have made considerable sacrifices for our country. My service-connected disability status should serve as a testimony to that end. I can't play with my kids because I can't walk without pain. I take twice daily pain medication so I can work a normal day's worth. These are crosses. These are crosses that I bear due to my service to our great country, and I would do it again to protect this great country. I'm so glad that you would be willing to play football in prep school again to protect this great country. Shame on you, Mr. Castillo. Shame on you. You may not have broken any laws. We're not sure yet. You did misrepresent to the SBA, but you certainly broke the trust of this great nation. You broke the trust of veterans. Iraq and Afghanistan veterans right now are waiting an average of 237 days for an initial disability rating. And it is because people like you who are gaming the system are adding to that backlog so that young men and women who are suffering from post-traumatic stress, who are missing limbs, cannot get the compensation and the help that they need. And I'm sure you paid through, played through the pain of that foot all through college. Well, let me tell you something. I recovered with a young man, a Navy corpsman, who, while he was running into an ambush where the, his Marines were hurt, had his leg knocked off with an RPG. He put a tourniquet on himself and crawled forward. He is who played through the pain, Mr. Costello. You did not. You took advantage of a system. You described the status just today that other companies were using these special statuses as competitive weapons against you. You who never picked up a weapon in defense of this great nation very cynically at, took advantage of the system. You broke the faith with this nation. You broke the faith with the men and women who lie in hospitals right now at Walter Reed, in Bethesda, at uh, Brook Army Medical Center in Lanstu. You broke the faith with them. And if this nation stops funding veterans' health care and stops and calls into question why veterans deserve their benefits, it is because cases like you have poisoned the public's opinion on these programs. I hope that you think twice about the example that you are setting for your children. I hope that you think twice about what you are doing to the nation, the, this nation's veterans who are willing to die to protect this nation. Twisting your ankle in prep school is not defending or serving this nation, Mr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I've gone, you've been very indulgent. I yield back.
Uh, I thank the gentlelady, and the time was well spent. And I cannot add on to that except to want to make sure the record is clear since you are under oath. Uh, you said the word broken uh, in your testimony just now, but my understanding from staff is that the X ray taken at the time of your injury did not show a break. Additionally, I want to make this clear for the record, and you can clear the record up if we don't understand it correctly. In your VA application and with a, a doctor's support, you claim that your twisted ankle came from football, as the gentlelady just said. However, in your transcribed interview before this committee, you said you slipped on a rock in, uh, well, orienteering. For the record today, which one is the truth? Um, so I believe that Dr. Wilson submitted that um, I was hurt playing football, that I told him that. And so when meeting with the committee, I told them, and in preparation for meeting with them, I noticed that the date of injury noted uh, on the, on my, uh, from Patterson Hospital at Fort Monmouth was November 19th, which was after football season. So my response was that it could not have happened, that specific injury, during football. Uh, the letter that was submitted stated that he had said that I had told him, and I think I told Mr. Davis that I would check. I did go back to Colonel Wilson and ask him, um, you know, what was his recollection of a conversation we had had in 2005 that led him to write the letter uh, in support of the VA application, which was to be submitted by doctors who treated me for my injury. And he would said to his best recollection, I told him I was hurt playing football. So I believe that he submitted that in truth. And in preparation, as I mentioned, the dates did not line up. So I did suffer a subsequent injury. And so I believe that what he had said is that based on the injury I had suffered, it was probably a relapse or it caused an ag aggravation of the injury. So I think that answered one of your questions. I think you had three in there. Do you have others? I apologize. I don't remember all three of them. VA football orientation and whether it was a break. You, you said in your testimony just a few minutes ago to the gentlelady that it was broken. Y yes. And it is not, not an ankle. So first and foremost, your service to this great country is well known. And, I, and so just to let you know, I didn't set my 30 percent disability or your 20 percent disability. And, and I think that But you are taking advantage of it. And you went after that disability rating for the benefit of your company because, you, as you said, other companies were using these statuses as a competitive weapon against you. You said that today. Yeah, Ma'am, when I said that, I meant that they were using the protest process of the procurement as competitive weapons, not my disability. So I apologize if I at all stated that they were using my, my disability as a competitive weapon. I meant that they were protesting awards uh, as competitive weapons against our company. So thank you for allowing me to clear that up. And again, I don't set the ratings, um, and, and it was in keeping and speaking with Dr. Uh, Wilson, who is Colonel Wilson, retired, who was at Monmouth uh, Hospital on Fort Monmouth, um, that he had said that I may be able to qualify. And, and, and you made the decision to apply for a disability rating for a twisted ankle from either football or orienteering. You can't, you, you haven't even answered the chairman's question. So, you were there. Did you twist your ankle or did you break or did you twist it playing football? Do you not remember? Was it orienteering? Was it football? Which was it? Well, to answer your question, it was not a sprained ankle. It was a broken foot. And I believe that the X-ray technician wrote that there was a much, I don't, I'm not a doctor, uh, or that led to it, but it was, in essence, they X-rayed it and they showed a, a sufficient change uh, in the malformation. I forget exactly. So in speaking with the doctor, I said, can you really just simplify that for me? He says, you broke your foot. That's what he told me. I thank the gentlelady, and, and I would trust that uh, the VA can take note of testimony here today and reopen the case to at least get to an accurate record and then an accurate determination. We now go to a medical doctor from Tennessee, Dr. Desjolais. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as a former VA physician and someone who had the privilege of treating many of our great veterans, uh, both service-connected and not, I do think that uh, one thing that is very important is a good history. Uh, when did your injury occur? Sir, um, fall, the initial injury, fall 1984, and the second injury, November 19, uh, 1984. 
Okay. So in 1984, uh, how did the first injury occur? What were you doing and what was your title? Uh, I believe I was an E-2 enlisted soldier, sir. Okay. And, um, in prep school, and how did the injury happen? Uh, I believe the initial injury happened playing football. Okay. So you are playing football, you went and got an X-ray, and that's when they told you it was broken? Uh, no, sir. The initial injury uh, was not X-ray, and that's not when they made the broken foot. I was treated by trainers. Okay. Uh, and when was the second injury? November 19, 1984. How, how many months apart was that? Probably not a month. A month apart. Okay. No, so you had a second injury they're, they're and you were playing football at that time? No, sir. I was hurt in the field during the orienteering exercise. Okay. And you got an x-ray at that time? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's when they thought it was broken? Yes, sir. Okay. And so it healed in six to eight weeks. You were put in a cast. You were on crutches? Uh, on crutches and... Um, uh, well, uh, orthotics or wrapped up sure. or whatever. And by eight weeks, I, I don't, you were walking on it again. And then when did you play football again? The next year? Um, yes, sir. And how many years did you play football after that? Four years after Four that. Four years of football. Well, what about yes, your sir. athletic career after that? Did you play golf, any other sports, tennis? Um, I played golf very poorly, uh, yeah. but I played some softball. Okay, softball. Do you still play golf? Uh, no, sir. Okay, when's the last time you participated in sports? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went out with some buddies and played some. Okay, so you can still you can still get around on it, okay, despite having a thirty percent disability service connect for this injury. Yes, sir. I have a uh, since you're a doctor, you I have a, mm. a fused, uh, I think, navicular area mm. um, that that was fused. And so, twenty-seven years later, you decided that this must have been from the original injury. That's what the doctors decided. Um, no, sir. After suffering for, for 20 plus years, I went and saw a doctor, and, okay. he, and, he, and he established the broken foot and, and, and did the, fusion, the three fusion exercises, uh, fusion uh, surgeries. Excuse me. I'm sure that doesn't make you feel much better, Ms. Duckworth, but thank you for updating us on the history. Um, Ms. Tucker, at the beginning of the hearing this morning, Gregory Roseman invoked his Fifth Amendment right against uh, incrimination, did not testify. Uh, as the Deputy Commissioner of the IRS, is it your expectation that an IRS employee will, before, will uh, appear before the committee to testify about official action taken within the scopes of his duties at the IRS? Sir, we expect all IRS employees to cooperate with members of Congress. But he didn't. He did not. Uh, Ms. Lerner didn't. Each of these individuals, mm -hmm. as uh, Mr. Cummings said, invoke their constitutional yeah. okay. rights. And this is an agency you have been with 29 years, and you stated in your testimony you are very proud of your service there and very proud of this agency, despite you know, the multiple black eyes they have right now. Has the IRS taken any disciplinary action against Mr. Roseman as a result of this committee's investigation or TICTA's investigation? So, sir, when I became aware uh, from the Treasury Inspector General of Investigations in mid-May, of hard evidence that they had found regarding uh, inappropriate uh, texting by Mr. Roseman. I directed uh, the procurement organization, um, his superiors, to uh, reassign him from a management position. But you agree that he would be uniquely qualified to testify about what we are wanting uh, today? Yes, sir. Okay. So the fact that he invoked his Fifth Amendment, that, that's his right. But uh, the fact that Lois Lerner did, too, and the American people are wanting answers. What is going on with the IRS? We have got targeting of conservatives. We have got excessive spending. We have got situations like this. I, I understand you want to be proud of who you work for, and you should be. But how are we going to get justice? Do you, do you think that uh, the IRS needs to bring people to justice? You were in on these meetings. Uh, Mr. Jordan asked you why you were in on those meetings, and he asked you what was the initial reaction, and nobody has given us a reaction. Nobody was shocked. But we, you agree that targeting conservatives groups was wrong? Uh, 